so um yeah i forgot to change this title slide um we we gave these user trainings every uh quarter um so the last one was back in february and these slides are modified from our um uh data expert at NERSC, who is lisa um so my name is quite close in fact i've been called lisa in the past um but i'm lippy uh but thank you to lisa for making these slides and um uh, she's, she's definitely the expert. So, uh, there might be things that, um, you have questions on if for some reason I'm not able to answer or Helen or Charles, we can definitely ask Lisa, but I bet that between three or four of us who are in this room, we'd probably be able to help you. Um, even if we're not, we're not Lisa, we, none of us could be Lisa. Um, we have a lot of amazing Lisa's on staff because the other person you saw was Lisa. That was a different Lisa, actually. So we have several Lisa's and they're all awesome. Okay, so let's talk about data storage and sharing best practices. So we did show you the file systems, but just as an overview, because again, I know this is a lot of material and uh, you'll you'll take some time to process. <laughs> Um, but again, this hopefully you remember this from earlier from Rebecca's talk. Um, we have several different system, uh, different parts of the system um, and different um, storage options. So we have this all flash scratch, which is sometimes considered like local because it's like directly connected to Perlmutter. And then these off platform as in they're connected via the internet, um, these other three options. Um, this is called the community file system. Sometimes I've seen it called common, um, but I think more, more often it's called community file system. Um, and then there's home and then there's that tape archive. So again, you um, kind of saw this, but let's go back through this. So the memory is like the memory per node. Um, and so that's obviously, if you can have whatever you need ready to go in your memory, that's going to be the best. Um, but the next best is Scratch. So in particular, let's say you have uh, some simulation and it's going to be writing a bunch of data. You want it to tell it to write to Scratch because that is going to be the fastest, most, um, the, the, the best performance that you can get on our system will be reading and writing from Scratch, reading and writing data from Scratch. Um, the next would be commu the community file system. So this is, um, it's still pretty fast, um, but not as fast as Scratch. So we really uh, think of a scratch is the, the the better option. And then there's HPSS. And um, again, you see the capacity goes up as the performance goes down a little bit. So HPSS is huge. And this is where you're going to be storing long-term storage of archival data. But that means you're really not accessing it very much at all. And I mean, like, once a year, maybe, or you're just keeping it, you know, we'll talk a little bit more about what kinds of things go in HPSS or in this tape archive. Um, but these are things that you're not accessing all the time versus with with the community and the scratch um, file spaces, you're going to, you can access that much qu quicker. Um, then we have this global common space. Uh, we're going to talk about it, but it's really for keeping software. It's also very performant um, when it comes to accessing um, libraries or binaries or software stacks um, when you're computing, actively computing on the system. That's also a good option. And then there's your global home. This is kind of where you enter into the system, but it's really small and it's really not a good space to keep too many things. And we'll talk about that too. Um, so a couple policy pieces of information, because sometimes there is a difference between policy and like technical capability. So we have certain policies that are meant to, you know, describe what NERSC provides and does and how we implement our, our uh, storage. So, um, you know, we provide a uh, means for everybody to store and manage and share their data. Um, it's, uh, the intent is that you're using these resources for active allocation. So once, you know, you are all probably part of an active allocation, but if for some reason you're hearing like, I mean, this shouldn't. Ha this will not happen over the summer. But if you're not a, su a summer researcher and you're uh, just a going to be continuing using NERSC for a while, um, if the allocation ends, um, you need to transfer your data because you can't just like store data with us long term if you're not actively using NERSC. Um, so you'll need to move it, and we have ways of doing that. Um, PIs, um, so those principal uh, investigators, they can um, request, um, you know, certain uh, certain ta actions. 
Um, and those are, uh, you know, any data that's associated with the NERSC award, um, you can ask us to do certain things for you. Um, and then files are protected using um, Unix file permissions. Um, and the Unix file permissions page is one of our most popular in our documentation. Um, and it's based on your user and group IDs. Um, so if you need to keep your permissions set in a certain way, you will need to change those permissions. And most, um, so depending on where, so for example, Scratch is is only read write to the specific user, but then um, the community file system, for example, is I think at least readable by the group. Um, and so you will, you and you can change those, what the permissions that you need for things for your files. Um, but it is, you know, your responsibility to manage and back up your data with our help. So we have, we, we can help you and we can give you the, the tools and we can tell, you know, give you the best idea of how to do these things. Um, but, um, it's your responsibility to sort of take what we're saying and put it into action for yourself. So let's go a little bit more into detail. So that home directory I talked about. So this is permanent, uh, meaning we don't purge it or delete things or anything like that, but it's really small. It's 40 gigabytes of space. Um, and again, it's not tuned for performance. Um, so, and again, 40 gigabytes when you're doing, especially doing simulations and stuff is really, really small. So you do not want to be keeping your, your files and your, your, um, uh, big data files and running things out of this home directory um, because it'll fill up. And then if it does, your job will crash. Um, so it's really just um, for, for like shell scripts or maybe source codes, things like that. Just things you want to keep handy, but um, nothing very big. Then we have the community file system. So again, this is also permanent. We don't delete anything, uh, remove anything, and it's much larger. Um, it's medium performance. So again, like I said, it's not the best, but it's not the worst. Um, and it has these snapshots. And I'll talk about snapshots uh, more in a moment, but these are little backups. And um, you, you'll you have snapshots for up to seven days in the past. So basically, if I had some data and I realized, you know, oh, last week I was working on this and I need it back, I accidentally deleted it. We keep it your data for up to seven days. Um, so if it was seven, if it was seven days or less, we have it for you and we have these snapshots and we can, you can restore them. Uh, but any more than that, um, we probably don't have it. Um, and yeah, so, so it's really good for sharing data within your research group. So it's a great way because it's group readable. Um, if you put, you say, Hey, you know, I put some data in this file here in CFS, um, someone else in your project, like your mentor or another student or whoever can um, access it. And then the local scratch, so again, local being like it's kind of attached to Perlmutter, uh, not over the internet. Um, it's really big, but it's temporary, um, which means that we do purge data that has not been used, uh, read in any way in uh, for eight weeks. So it's it's really for active computing, like you are running something, you're storing data, you know, while you're doing some kind of um, computation, and then you move it somewhere else. So it's not backed up. We don't do these snapshots. Um, and it's it's really meant for staging data and performing computations. Um, so please remember, Scratch is not permanent. Um, it, things do get purged. And then there's the long-term storage, the um, archival um, storage. And I thought I had a video of this. Um, yeah, let me keep going because I actually have a little video so you can actually see what it looks like. It's really fun. Um, okay, so yeah, so I'm gonna go even more into detail. So um, Perlmutter Scratch, um, the quota that you have, so I, I mentioned this, directories are user-readable and writable by default. It is purged, so make sure you back up important data. Um, and you'll see this bandwidth here is super, super fast. So again, it's for that active computing, five terabyte bandwidth, um, but uh, you need to move stuff out of there. 
The quota, which means how much space you're given by default, is 20 terabytes. Um, soft meaning you can request more if you need more. And then 30 terabytes is, I think, the max we can give each person. Um, if you, if you for some reason, have even more than that, you will basically need to find a way to sort of segment data and move part of it off so that you can keep doing what you're doing. Um, so 30 is the, the absolute maximum limit, but we start by giving you 20. Um, and uh, the way to use it is to uh, move your run scripts into Scratch and then have your application set up to read write data within Scratch. So make sure your file path locations are within Scratch because that's how it will, um, that's when we say, you know, use it for our active computing, that means, you know, all the file paths are pointing to um, Scratch. Um, this is this might be a little bit advanced. Actually, I've never used this before. Um, if you're familiar with data striping or if this is important to you, um, that is something that you can optimize and change for your performance uh, for of your application. Um, so depending on the file size, we offer different um, ways of striping your data across uh, the different um, object storage units. Um, and so there's more information here, again, in the documentation. Um, go ahead and take a look if this is something that you might need to do for your application. If you're not familiar with this, don't worry. Um, we have a default setting that should work for, for many applications. Okay. The next I want to cover is global common software. Um, so this is, um, I will, let me, um, this is one of the, um, not one of the super performant ones, except for, for loading data. So it's actually mounted as read only on the compute system. And what that means is it's really good for loading libraries um, and uh, your data, your, your software stack um, in order to run your um, job. Um, this this plot here that I'm showing is um, different like seconds for um, certain reads um, at different times of the day for different systems. So um, the pro so the the different things are shifter, which is our container service, um, common, which is the one we're talking about here, um, scratch, which is uh, what I'm just talking about, and the project directory, which is um, the the CFS, the co a community file system. And common is the fastest for uh, like reading uh, li like libraries, loading libraries. So so shifter is actually at the bottom. So if you are ready to use containers, that is something to look at if you're really concerned about performance optimization. But the next best is to have your data um, on the common file system. And that will be in some cases, just as good as Shifter. Um, so then you don't have to prepare a container. Um, that's the second line down here. And this basically, you want this to be fast. So you want this read to be super, super fast. Um, so a minimal amount of time. Um, OK. Yeah. Um, right. So then uh, the community file system, uh, like I mentioned, this is the one that's your project directory. Um, and so this is for data. Once you're done computing it on Scratch and you're ready to move it off so that you can do your next set of computation um, or you don't want it to get deleted, right? Because Scratch is the one that gets purged regularly versus the community file system uh, doesn't get purged. Um, but it's a, it's not quite as... Um, actually, no, the, the, the amount of space you get in, in the community file system can be pretty big too. So a lot of times people will move their data there once they're um, maybe just doing some data analysis or they just need to keep it handy while they're writing up their paper. Um, they might move it into the community file system for a bit in case they need to access it. Um, and yeah, so if you're trying to trying to use it, um, the how-to here is uh, in your, once you're logged into Perlmutter, you're going to use CD. Um, you can use the dollar sign CFS. This is like a little shorthand to get to um, the community file system and then your project number. So for a lot of people, this will be an M and then a series of two or three letter or two, three or four numbers, sorry. Um, and that's how you access the like folder for your project. And then in there, you can make a directory with the name of your choice. So 
you know, sometimes I just use El Gupta. That's my first initial and my last name. So that it's like, okay, this is where I'm working on stuff. And then the nice thing is if I have someone I'm collaborating with, they are able to actually go into my folder and take a look and, you know, see whatever I'm working on if I need to share it with them. Um, one thing to note, if you are, um, going to be reading from CFS, um, during your jobs, you actually need to use a slightly different mount. Um, you're going to want to use this DBS R and I'm going to talk about what DBS is. Um, so if you, you know, it's best to use scratch, but if there's some reason that you need to use CFS during your job, uh, we recommend the file path that you use is actually this DBS file path to CFS. Um, there, so there's a, a different, slightly different mount, um, and this is going to be more optimized. Um, and yeah, so different in, within this project, so your space that you're given is based on the project, but your um, PI can actually change how much space you get. So you, so like your project might get, I don't know, 30 terabytes, and each person gets, you know, two terabytes to start with, but let's say one person in your project isn't really using that space, your PI can actually change things for you and give you a little bit more space. The snapshots, so these are these backups that we keep for seven days. Um, if you realize like, hey, I deleted something, but I need it. Um, basically what you can do is go to, um, in this case, CFS, um, that's, let's say that's where the data was that you need and you need to restore. So go, go to that location and then type in CD dot snapshots. So this is going to be, this is basically a folder where we keep all of these backups and you can see which one you need. So it'll be saved by date. Um, I don't remember if there's more information than just the date. I think it should just be the date because it should be seven days worth of data. And you you won't, the only thing you can do is copy something out of there. So you can use CP. If you don't know what these letters are, um, this is um, basically, these are shell commands, um, uh, you know, terminal commands, um, but CP it means copy and you're going to copy that file. So this will be the, um, the path to the file that you need and you're going to tell it there's a space right here um and then the the second part of this is the location you're trying to put it so what you're going to end up doing is you can see what files are in the snapshot directory and then copy it into uh your current directory so you can't actually go in and like modify or do anything with these snapshots you can just copy out the file or data that you need into your current directory um Okay, so this is a really great video of HPSS. Um, everybody, if you go to down to the server room, hopefully you'll get to see. Um, basically, it's uh, some of you may I don't know who's all in the room, but depending on maybe when you were born, um, you may not have experienced cassette tapes, uh, but they're basically little um, uh, rectangular sort of pieces of plastic, and there's like a uh, kind of like a cellophane tape type of material, but it's magnetic um, and it's wound inside of there. And that's where the data is stored on this like physical tape material. And then each of those is is stored, uh, like a physically stored in one of these little um, shelves. And when you need to act, I'll turn this down because you just hear the blowers. This robot goes and actually retrieves the tape and puts it in a place where you can uh, where it will be read. So this is the little robot moving around. Someone requested a certain tape and the robot went and got it and uh, put it in this thing probably where it gets read. Um, so when we say tape archive, we this is what we mean. Um, and hopefully you'll get to actually go and see it. About 10 minutes looking. Okay. Um, okay, so the point of the tape archive is for keeping your sort of data, raw data that you need, like from a finished paper. Um, you need to just keep it for a long time. Um, and there's a special way to put data in there. You don't want to be putting a ton of tiny files um, and trying to save them each little tiny file. You actually want to kind of bundle them together. Um, and we have instructions on how to do that because uh, it's important to do it in a in a strategic way. So if you, for some reason, need to use it, maybe you're part of a 
project and they have some data in the tape archive, um, what I would recommend is going to our, again, our documentation and looking up archive and reading about the best way to read and write from there because um, it's it's a little bit different than just, um, uh, you know, seeding to like any other mounted uh, storage system. It's similar, but it, it, it requires a little bit more. Um, then we have our home directory. So again, home directory is that one that's really, really small. Um, 40 gigabytes, and this you can't change, you can't get more. Um, if you run out of room, you have to delete stuff or move it somewhere. Um, and it's again, it's not for any kind of intensive work, it's just for you know, maybe keeping a little script around or just some notes or some something small. It's basically where you land. Um, so when you first log into the system, you'll be in your home directory. Think of it kind of as the foyer to your, your house or like a apartment or whatever. It's kind of like just where you first enter the door into the house. Um, so it's not really a great place to like keep a bunch of things. Maybe you'll keep your shoes and put down your book bag or something, but you're not going to be like sitting down with your meal and your food and all that kind of stuff in your entryway. Like you're going to enter the house and do all of that somewhere else. Uh, and again, the snapshots work exactly the same as we saw previously. Sorry, just uh, kind of skipping through a few things. Um, I'm going to, okay. So DVS, and I, again, I'm not the expert on this. So um, if you end up having more questions after this, um, we'll direct those accordingly. Um, but DVS is uh, something that we use at uh, on our on our system. It's an I/O forwarder, and it's uh, it's it's meant to offer a really good, very high performance uh, for I/O on our system. Um, I'm not going to go through all of these things, um, but most of what's here is something I've already told you. Um, so, for example, and when we talk about Conda environments, um, you're you're going to hear about this in a second. Uh, from, or not in a second, but yeah, maybe in a few minutes from Charles. Um, there's basically a specific place that you should put them um, in global common. And we talked about global common. So in general, you want to be putting um, those uh, libraries, common environments, your software stack into global common. And then you probably won't have any issues um, from loading up Python packages from your, your home directory. Um, in general, if it in out, if you're using Scratch, you you probably like 99% won't have any problems. So uh, I've probably drilled it into your head to use Scratch when you're actively computing. You may never run into any issues if you do that. Um, I did mention if your data is too big for Scratch and you need to read it off CFS, there's a special mount to use for that. So basically you can see here that instead of using, um, so like the full, so when you see that dollar sign and the CFS, that's basically a shorthand for these three things here in the beginning, the global CFS seeders. Um, instead of that, you're going to use this DF, D, DBSRO instead of global. Um, and I'm not even going to talk about this because I don't even know what that is. Um, so like I said, if you follow the, 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 the sort of things that I've been saying, especially about Scratch, you may never need to worry about DBS and um, you just, you won't even know it's there and it'll just be in the background helping you do your work faster. Um, I am also not gonna talk about this because you, if, unless you're a PI, if you're a PI, um, there's something called the PI tools. Um, so if you are a PI, you may wanna look into this, um, but I'm gonna just get through this um, because we are sort of running low on time. It's, um, time. it's okay. Yeah, no, no, I want to I want to get to this because this is actually um, something that a lot of people will probably need to do, which is to share data and move it around. So sharing inside of NERSC, uh, the best thing you can do is just put your data in CFS because then it's available to your group. Um, so that's the easiest thing to do is if you put whatever you worked on and it's in there, it's automatically available to other people. Same for HPSS. Uh, permissions are group readable, writable. Um, if some of you are working in these collaboration accounts, these are accounts that are tied to like a group instead of an indiv individual. So uh, for example, if you're like at the ALS or I think like uh, Desi has one of these, um, there might be a different way that they access or they they control some of this stuff, um, but they also have 
lots of different ways for um, sharing data and so forth. Um, if you are working in Scratch, which hopefully by the end of this presentation, you will <laughs> know that that's probably the best thing to do. Um, you It only has um, read access, I guess. Um, so you can do a few things to change um, uh, your, your permissions. Um, I think in general, I mean, so you can do this. I'm, I'm not sure if you, um, you know, I, we won't, I mean, I will advocate a certain way or the other, but I do think it might be easier actually to just put your data, to, to just copy your data or move it into CFS if you're trying to share it with someone else who's in the same project as you rather than changing the permissions necessarily in Scratch, but you can do that. Um, and so this shows you what you can do. And then we also have this really, this is actually super convenient, um, this utility called give and take. And it's literally what it sounds like. It's just a way to like give someone a file without having to like move it or anything. So the way this works is you literally in, once you're signed into Perlmutter, you will type give and then uh, minus you, that's a flag for user. And then you're going to type in the receiving username. So let's say you're trying to send me a file, you would type in my username, which means you have to know the username of the person, which I, you know, if you, ideally, you know who it is because you shouldn't be sending files to random people, um, but you would know what their username is. And you would type that in here and then you would leave a space and you would type the file, the, the path to the file or directory that uh, you want to give to them. And then the person on the receiving end, they'll actually get an email, which will tell them, hey, someone has given you this file, which is great because uh, then they know it's ready for them. And then uh, they can go onto the system, log in, same way through SSH or on Jupyter or however they want to do it. And they can use take and they can um, take, they, they know who sent it to them. So that's another important thing is to know who sent it to you and then the name of the file. And if you need, um, so it'll, it, I'm pretty sure when the, you get the email, it'll tell you the name of the file. But um, if you go to our documentation, it has more instructions on how to look and see, like, let's say you, for some reason, don't remember the name of the file. You There's a way to use this utility to look at the, the files that are available to you and then take the one you need. Um, so if you need to share your data with external people, there's a couple ways to do it. Um, so your specific project will actually have basically a public URL um, where you can put your project data um, and have it be available to the world. Um, if you, for some reason, want it to be, um, there is a way to do that. And basically you have this, I think it's this www. So then that becomes immediately accessible to the, to the outside world. Um, maybe if you don't want to share your data, don't put it in there. Um, there are ways to make web portals um, that will allow you to share your data um, outside of uh, NERSC. And so I would recommend looking into these science gateways. I don't have a ton of information about them, but if you feel like you're going to need to do some sharing um, of data or something else with the outside world, um, take a look at science gateways. Um, and you may actually want to host web applications. So Spin, like I said, that's what's running Jupyter Hub. You can actually make your own web applications in Spin and have them hosted at NERSC um, so that they have access to whatever your data is on NERSC. And um, for example, you could have be making your own database and you want to give people access to that database. We have those tools for you in Spin. Um, so if you think that's something that you will need, um, I would have, and actually the spin training is, I think happening at the same time. The spin training is amazing. Um, they are just really, really good at, uh, teaching you how to use spin. So, um, if you are going to use it, definitely take that training. The next thing though is called Globus. And this is the best way to share data, especially huge amounts of data across the, the, the internet, basically. Um, let's see. Um, okay, let me, I think I'm going to come back to Globus in a few slides. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, uh, sorry. I don't know if there was a question. Maybe like wrap up in one to two minutes, Slippy, and yeah. we can move on. 
Yes. Um, okay. I'm just going to share quickly about these data transfer nodes. Um, if you do need to do data transferring, you can use these special nodes that are, are specifically for transferring data. Um, they are called DTNs and there's four of them. So when you need to connect to one of them, you'll basically just pick DTN 01 or 02 or whatever. And then you can SCP your data from one, uh, one place. So from NERSC onto your local system. Um, so here is just an example of how to do it. Um, I think... <laughs> I think this is right. I actually, um, now that I think about it, I'm not sure if I've used this uh, over a DTN before, because sometimes you can just SCP directly off of Perlmutter. Um, so I'm pretty sure this is correct, but if for some reason it's not, uh, please make sure you ask me um, and I'll double check, but I'm, I, I'm pretty sure that's the correct way to do it. So if you need to be moving data around, um, you, you can use these DTNs. They're only for moving data. So please don't SSH in there and try to do anything else. That's not their purpose. They're only for moving data. And we have really good performance across different sites and uh, you know, for, for your personal institution, whatever, um, this is a good way to do it. Um, I didn't get to talk too much about Globus, but um, please go check out the Globus documentation. Um, so this is again, a really, really good tool. We This is our recommended tool for moving data in and out of NERSC. Um, because it it will manage everything for you. You can just say, hey, I need to send this data and it'll do it. It'll email you if something goes wrong and it can just be running in the background. Um, so if you're, if for some reason, especially maybe at the end of the summer, if you're a summer student and you need to take home all your data, um, please make sure to use this. And the Globus documentation on our webpage has like a step-by-step. -step, and so it's gonna tell you exactly what to do. So this is what it looks like. So it takes a little bit of setup, but once you do the setup, it will be um, very easy to do. Okay, um, that's actually it. This is just a summary slide for you to look at um, in the future, not right now, <laughs> um, but it kind of is uh, all, most of the information that I've shared with you uh, kind of all in, in one place. And that's it. Um, if there's questions, I'll take a look in the Q&A and uh, yeah, we can move on. Sorry, I know we're running super duper behind. Thank you, Libby. <laughs>